Today we're going in a Wayback Machine, and we're going to learn a little something about two different kinds of preamps. And our question comes from Joost in the Netherlands, who writes, Paul, what's the difference, especially regarding sound characteristics, between an active and a passive preamp? And why and when would I pick one over the other? Thanks, Joost. Well, Joost knows something that a lot of people don't know, and that is that there are actually two types of preamps, a passive and, a, and an active, though you don't see many passive preamps. In short, a passive preamp is a volume control and an input selector that does not plug into the wall. It's By passive, it means it uses no uh, power out of the wall, if you will. It, it, it's completely passive. It's like passive means it's just there's just passive components like resistors um, and switches in it. And you turn the volume up and down through a potentiometer, which is nothing more than a variable resistor. It's it could be in, in or or a stepped attenuator, or uh, sometimes people use a. Uh, uh, a transformer, an audio transformer, and you, when you click it, you go into various taps on the transformer. There's any number of ways that people build passive preamplifiers, and they do that to eliminate any chance of sonic degradation that you might find through an actual amplification stage, because the, the best we can hope for with any amplification stage is that it does no harm. And, of course, Every time you pass a signal through something, you're going to do a little bit of harm. So the, the trick is, with a cable, with a preamp, with anything, you want to do no harm. And um, so that's, that tends to be a pretty big challenge. An active preamp is actually the same thing. It has the same components of a potentiometer, an input selector, and uh, a, a box and all that. But it also has an active amplification stage in it to boost the level of the signal up and that does plug in the wall and that's what you're commonly used to in a preamp. So uh, we want to go over the differences but let me just tell you quickly the, the the story of how passive preamps came into being because we made one of the very first if not the first I don't know I, I hate saying that we were the first in anything because I I really don't know but at the time we made it I don't think there were any that I knew of for sure. So years ago, in 1974-75, we made a phono preamplifier, and all it did was amplify the output of a turntable, and then you had to take the amplifier, the phono preamplifier's output, and plug it into your own preamplifier, or receiver, or integrated. And the reason that you would do that is because our phono stage sounded better than the one inside your product. So it was an add-on phono stage. It had gazinas and gazadas. You plug the turntable into one end and the output went through a pair of RCA jacks and into your device. Years, uh, well, in years, geez, actually it was months after we started selling those, those phono preamplifiers, people said, hey, um, I don't want to plug this into my integrated or my preamplifier, my Dynaco, whatever it was at the time. I'd like to plug it into your uh, box. I mean, you guys know enough to make this phono preamp. Why don't you t Why don't you make the other half of it with the volume control? And at the time, we were listening to a pot. There was no our phono preamplifier had a lot of gain. And there was no reason to amplify it more as a preamp. In fact, all we ever did is turn it down, right? So our phono preamplifier, we just rigged up a little box with a, a potentiometer. It was a 10K Alps or Noble. It was one of the two. It was a good sounding pot that we put on and it had a pair of inputs and outputs. And so we plugged that in and out straight to the power amplifier, and we would turn the pot up and down, and we would listen to our stereo. We could play it as loud as we possibly wanted, and of course as low. And we did that because we wanted to make sure that when we designed this phono preamplifier, we weren't designing it to help the sound of, an act, of a secondary active stage, right? I mean, as, as a design tool, you don't want to do that. If we had already made the active stage of a preamplifier, then we would continue tuning by ear this phono preamp fire to make that sound good but then when you used it in somebody else's preamp you wouldn't have the same results so we wanted the cleanest way possible and we just had a pot 
There's very little or a switched attenuator, but a pot was fine. When it came time to making our own preamplifier, we, we thought, well, this shouldn't be too bad. We'll just design the best little stage that we know, slap it at the output of this, this pot, um, and, and then uh, on its input have a, a switch. So you could select from multiple inputs, maybe at a tape deck or whatever you had back then. And we did that, and it sounded, it was, it just, it just robbed our circuit of life. We went back to the pot, there it came again. A little wimpy in the bass, but still, it sounded best just straight through the pot. So my partner, Stan Warren, the S of PS Audio, came up with an idea. Just, let's design the best output stage for a preamplifier that we know how to do. And we'll build that into this new preamp that we at the time called the Linear Control Center. But since that's nothing that I would listen to or, or, or and myself, neither of us wanted to listen to it because we know we knew that it degraded the sound. We put a switch on the front and the switch allowed you to listen straight through a passive preamp which is just the input selector and the pot, or if you needed the extra gain, you could suffer the slight amount of degradation that that stage provided, and, um, and that you were stuck with that. So what were the differences? Well, when you were in the passive preamp stage, as I had said, you lost a little bit of slam on the bottom end, and this is because a pot, the output of a pot, and we had to keep the, the impedance to about 10K. You couldn't have a very high impedance pot because uh, this problem got worse and worse as the impedance of the pot went up. Um, as you turned it up, you started having problems driving cables, the, the cables that would uh, connect your preamplifier into your power amplifier. Uh, and the net result of that was you had a little wimpier slam and bottom end. It was just a little thin on the bottom. As soon as you clicked in the output stage, that got fixed. Now we could drive the cables beautifully. We had great bottom and good slam, but you had the degradation of the stage. So those are the two trade-offs. And it's just, I mean, nothing's perfect, but that's how a, a photo, a, a, a passive preamplifier works. And those are the, the good sides and the bad sides. So you just have to pick your poison and go with that and hope for the best. Great question. Thanks for the memories. Bye-bye. Thank you.